state domination as uh, their policy. You see, domination of the state became a uh, very powerful political factor after the First World War. And therefore, you can say that though Germany as a nation was defeated, her idealism won in one sense. And uh, is it possible that some sort of imperialism may be renewed now? That is a problem he discussed in chapter 9. And he feels that it has a very little chance of success uh, because the trial itself has become very difficult. And in the light of 40 years that have passed since he wrote this book, the chances have still more receded, we can say. When he wrote this book, it was 40 years back, and even then he said that renewing of imperialistic you know, movement in, in, by any nation or a power has become rather difficult now. And ideas doesn't seem to be practicable now, and even as a possibility, it is very remote or distant. And the only contingency now, we can say, which can arise only if Russia and the United States can come together to dominate the world. That's one. Another is if communist China and Russia can come together. You see, then there is a chance of world domination. But uh, this is my reading because it is based on this book and the situation then didn't arise at that time when he wrote the book 40 years before, <laughs> you see. And um, if they, both of them, both these things seem rather improbable. And even if either succeeds, the success seems to be precarious. The two combinations are first of all improbable, Russia and America coming together, or China and Russia coming together, looks very improbable. But even if they succeed, either of them successfully uh, trying to dominate, the success would be rather precarious. And that comes to the end of the first, I, I mean, ninth chapter practically, because it's a chapter which deals with the possibility of world empire. And as a question, I am putting it down in a short compass to, to go forward to chapter 10, which deals with the possibility of United States of Europe. That is the 10th chapter. The 10th chapter deals with the possibility of United States of Europe. And in that chapter, he works out that 18th and 19th century, the democratic idea was, you know, dominant in, in the internet politics of Europe, particularly, 18th and 19th century. But even in Europe, democracy as a constitution had not won fully. Democratic idea was there, but it had not won fully because you can see Central Europe and Russia were not democratic. In the sense, Central Europe and Russia were not democratic. So that gives the, the, the situation as it actually obtained in spite of the winning of the democratic idea became dominant among all politicians and political thinkers. But the idea had already triumphed not only in Europe, but in America and in Asia. All the South American republics and all the Asiatic countries that were rising at that time, Persia, India, Iran, and all these, well, they got the inspiration from that idea. So that the idea had won already in Europe, America, and Asia, the democratic idea. That is one that the 18th and 19th century gave to the world. Democratic idea, which though partially applied in Europe, well, won throughout the three con four, four continents of the world. Second thing that it gave was a perfectly organized state. Idea of a perfectly organized state, the need of a perfectly organized state. That was the contribution of Germany, you see. Basically, this is a socialistic idea. If you start study and go to the bottom of this, you know, idea of making a perfectly organized state, it means it will come to socialism. If you analyze the, the, the inspiring force below, you will find it, it comes to socialism. It will insist on equality. And socialism or even communism as a form of society, both are very old. It is not that this is now newly found. You see, in India, in the second century, in 2,600 years before, when Gautam Buddha was living, there were republics that were absolutely communistic. Absolute communism. So was also certain parts of city-states in Greece. And so, you know, communism as a 
as a philosophy of social you know form is not new it is as old as the world the government is saying that they have made something new is not true <laughs> it is only on a large scale now it applies to nation it applies to classes all over the nation and it becomes tend to become international because the the class consciousness is sought to be awakened you see the the effort is to awaken a class consciousness throughout the world irrespective of national barriers and cultural you know differences now here after the first this idea has now emerged after the first world war and even after the second world war it has almost come to the top in political life the idea of a organized state socialistic idea you can call it democratic socialism if you like because you don't want to compromise democracy and throw it out so but it is democratic socialism socialism of the same and uh, this is a one of the chief driving forces of political life today among all the nations of the world the nation self governing organizes its social and economic life now and claims to to organize it for the good of the collectivity <coughs> in actuality the imperialist idea was dominant till yesterday even now it's not yet gone belgium portugal holland italy japan till yesterday had their empires so that in spite of this democratic idea one the socialistic movement tending towards the organization of an efficient state third force is already there in operation the imperial idea actually now receding it is not that it is powerful it's not increasing but it is there as a practical force belgium you know holland portugal the big slices of the world you see and now they, they are not the only nation there there are others as well something here italy Spain. united states has philippines till yesterday isn't it <laughs> so <laughs> france has even now you see so has italy in the north africa so the imperialistic idea is a receding force but it is a force one idea that is thrown to the front is democratic idea and organization of a perfect state United States of Europe then he is dealing with that possibility in this chapter 10 it is a distinct possibility especially after the second world war you see but the fear is that if it comes really into a political organization of the continent of Europe it would perhaps try to dominate Asia and Africa that is one danger but what actually has taken place is well is something different what actually has taken place is a federation a federation not one that can unite the continent as was once dreamt of in times of the crusades but a military alliance led by the usa against soviet russia nato powers is it not that is what has actually taken place and now second thing that is taking place is the organization of european market there are the two items which you now see uh, are the possible this was 40 years back you must always bring that in your mind when uh, when you are dealing with the sight of a seer who has seen the play of forces in international life 40 years before now and even then he saw the possibility of united states of europe and he thought it would not become a political possibility if it became it would be a danger for africa and asia which i think is quite true if it became a political union but it is only now a military alliance led by the uso with the nato powers against the uh, threat of russia that's one and second thing nato does not include all the powers of europe either even as an alliance it's an uneasy group because france is always objecting to united states leadership isn't it i think that's an inner story which very few outside know but that is the the inner difficulty with France is that she doesn't want to be regarded as a second class power. Mm -hmm. See, and she is very jealous of her uh, being always the leader of continental Europe. She would happily like to leave England aside in the isolation of, you know, an insularity. But so far as continent was concerned, she always wants to be the leader. <laughs> it is Germany who first broke her, uh, you know, the domination of France uh, by the the prussian war and the, and the third napoleonic war you see after that but um, leadership protesting against her being treated as a second class power the economic political and commercial unification of europe 
which was far off seems to be drawing near with the signing of the well, European market organization which even England has joined. So that, that is the unity which, is, which has come. The unity that was projected, United States of Europe, instead of becoming politically an entity, it has become a military alliance against communism and an economic organization in order to protect the increasing industrial you know, capacity of European powers to be protected against well, on the of Russian products and also against United States industries. Remember, the United States is helping the organization of European markets, but uh, it might rebound to the United States industries ultimately, you see, because when all the European states are organized uh, economically and industrially, uh, probably the United States will have to have her plants planted in those countries in order to continue her industry at the peak at which she is working now, you see. She might have to, to organize in such a way as to put her industries in those countries rather than uh, develop industries here, you see. That would be one consequence that can come about. Well, complicated, uh, the main obstacles are the complicated system of administration of a modern state and national group egoism, which have a lot of fear and a sense of past grievances persisting. <laughs> the, the European organization doesn't come into active force because of that. Yes. Sir, sure, Rundo points out in this chapter that the United States of Europe, if it would be achieved, might try to dominate Asia and Europe. And this possibility has now receded very far into the background. Well, Yes, common European market, as I just told you, have come into existence and any chance of conflict between Asia and Europe, well, uh, is no far off now and if it came, it would be a very retrograde step. An organization of European states, either economical, industrial or military, fighting against or pitching itself against Asia, resurgent Asia, newly organizing itself, industry and political life and so on, if it pitted itself against it, it would be a retrograde step because it would be against the coming of human unity. Really speaking, it would not be an advantage or a progressive movement. It would be retro retrograde. And uh, it's not necessary either. He pleads in that chapter that it's not a necessary you know, item of, uh, of progress or, or growth of international life that Europe should pitch itself against Asia as a continent because there are plenty of avenues of exchange. First of all, he points out that the character of science and aspects of modern culture are cosmopolitan. Science is cosmopolitan. Science doesn't belong to a country or a, or a continent. Science belongs to the whole world. And so certain aspects of human culture also have now become cosmopolitan all over the world. And uh, therefore, it's not necessary that they should be pitted one against the other uh, in the interest of unity of mankind, which is uh, really the great thing that is coming. The need is to evolve, he says in that chapter, a new supranational or supranational above the nation, you see, a supranational order or supranational organization, which would be a free association of international life. The need is not to organize nations on their own basis, but to have a supranational organization. And it is that which would lead to the na natural unfolding of the spiritual and ethical powers of the race. It would free the race from too much occupation with the lower necessities of human life which binds it to the animal consciousness. And it may be the beginning of the development of the higher life. If a supranational organization is brought into existence, then the chances are that with the advance of science which we have and industrial capacity which mankind has developed, it would be easy to free mankind from the pressing necessity or needs of lower life, with which they are now very busy and much of the energy is occupied only in meeting the needs of animal life. Well, mankind would be freed from it and would be free to pursue uh, higher aspects of life. That would be the advantage of a supranational organization of international life if it was brought into existence. 
Now, that is uh, yes. Now we come to chapter 11, which is a small chapter in which he is trying to work out the small free units and larger concentrated unity. Now there, he is organizing or he is trying to show how the nation unit has evolved. Through what stages the development of nationhood has passed. Nation didn't come into its own all of a sudden at one bound. The organization or the actual realization by human being or humanity of its nation unit is a result of long process of evolution and in which contrary forces have been acting all through. So here he is pointing out the evolution of the nation unit. The nation unit began in various countries in forms of small states. The unit of nation in the beginning was not big nation but a small state like that those that were in Greece, in India, in Egypt, in China, in Arabia, in Israel. In all these countries, the beginning was small units. They began small, loose, cultural, geographical aggregates. They began as aggregates. Small, loose, cultural and geographical. You know, bound to one place. There were cultural units before, these were cultural units already before they became nation units. The seed of their nationhood rose from, well, their being united in one culture. They had already a common culture before they became a organized political nation unit. No. They were city-states, regional kingdoms or tribal states like Athens, Sparta or Ganarajya of India which flourished in the, in the time when, when Buddha was alive and when the founder of Jainism, Mahavir, was alive. Well, it is that time, about 500 years, there was a period where small principalities and free republics existed side by side. It is strange, but this is historical. You see, now found out by the research in the last 50 years that the small city republics were there small principalities there, kings were there, and republics which were communistic or socialistic in their constitution were also operating at the same time when Gautam Buddha lived. Such small communities are generally full of vigor, common life, and it is, they are turned easily and early to freedom. They, uh, being small, it is easy for them to, to turn to the idea of freedom. Monarchy or papacy could not flourish in those states. They are too jealous of their freedom to allow any, any one power or one individual to dominate. Sri Arvindo says about them, the tendency to a democratic freedom in which every man had a natural part in civic life as well as in cultural institutions of the state, an equal voice in the de determination of law and policy, and as much share in the execution as could be assured to him by his right as a citizen and his capacity as an individual. Well, this democratic tendency was inborn in the spirit and inherent in the form of the city-states. Why the city-states were so vigorous, full of life and vitality? It was because every citizen felt that he has a part to play. Now when there is such a big organization, big nation unit is there, the individual doesn't feel that he has any direct responsibility in the formulation of either law or policy or that he is part, a part of a living whole. Well, as a, whereas in Athens, an election was, was, was something because you know, you know everybody and everybody knew everybody else. And, and it was as if he has, he has a very definite part to play. Now having a very large, complex organization, you find it is very difficult for individual to feel that uh, vividness of life, of democracy, I mean the participation in the formulation of the law and so on. But in a small state it was quite easy and they were therefore more living. And the contribution they made to human culture is, cannot be compared to the contribution of big nation units. You cannot compare the qualities. It is they who gave whole European culture. In fact, they, they put the seed. 
a small state, you know, which is hardly one state of America, one, one, one province hardly of India, Greece. Well, it gave culture to the whole of continent of Europe because of that intensity of life, you see, of collective life, one, in, one unit of collective life actively living in which everyone thought that he was part of a whole, a living part of a living whole, you see. That is what gave it that culture which we find a uh, parent of European culture today. And so in social life, democratic equality is inevitable in small community. In a small community, you cannot maintain rights for a long time. These city-states advanced in culture because of the great creative force due to complete participation, not of a limited class, but of the individual generally in the many-sided life of the community. And the sense which is had of being full of energy of the whole and of a certain freedom to grow, to be himself and to achieve, to think, to create, in the undamned flood of universal energy. That's what he writes in that chapter about, you know, the 12th chapter, Evolution of the Nation Unit. Now, modern life, nation unit has become very large in modern condition. He's trying to restore this condition in a clumsy fashion, <laughs> that each one must feel that he is part of the whole and must feel the creative urge of the, of the nation unit, you see. Um, with vaster scientific progress and forces at its disposal. Those people hadn't got those means. Well, the nation unit now has got very powerful, effective, you know, scientific discoveries at its disposal to bring about this participation of the individual in the whole. The city-states had three defects. One, they had slaves who had no rights, you see. Petition in the plebeians, even Rome and in Greece also. The, the slaves had no, women had no vote and no right. They could not solve the problem of interrelation of states except by fight. They couldn't think, Sparta couldn't think of, uh, you know, dealing with, uh, with Athens except on this war. Thebes, Sparta, well, uh, Athens, each was a state. And each state's relation with the other was only on the basis of war. Couldn't imagine anything else. And thirdly, they became subject to, well, limits or limitations of narrow insularity. So you see, when this state is very small, it tends to become insular and in its thinking also becomes narrow. And the channels become very small in the mind. So after the collapse of Roman Empire, the creation of nation aggregates was the work which nature seems to have taken up. After the Roman Empire, you see the, the empires that preceded, as soon as somebody came to power, his first impulse was to conquer the world. And now this conquering of the world, you can go back to those empires which are now in the past, you see pre-nation unit empires, nation empires, I mean empires that came into existence before the nations were for organized. Sri Aruna says that if you study deeply, the effort was not to conquer the world, but to unite mankind. The idea was to make it one world, but it took the form of an outer compulsion, you see, military conquest. Even imperialistic and colonial you know, effort was at bottom inspired by this unity of mankind. Either one man conquers or a nation tries to conquer, the idea was to bring the one world into well, a sense of unity. That was really the driving force. But those empires were destroyed because, well, even the nations had not been organized. How could unite humanity be organized when even the nation you see, before the age of the nations coming into their own, bringing a whole mankind into unity was not even possible. So Alexander or anybody who preceded him, Macedonian, before you go to the other empires that existed, well, they, they broke up in no time because there was no real unity there possible. The effort behind was to conquer not for one man, really speaking, but it was idea to put human, a whole human race into one, you know, organization. But before the groups come into effective existence, collectivities, societies or nations, 
uh, it was not possible to put the whole humanity together. That's why they broke up. And they had to give place to the evolution or organization of nation units. After the breakup of the Roman Empire, nature seems to have taken up the organization of uh, nation units. The ancient city-states and regional kingdoms being cultural units in a geographical aggregate had many points in common but also many divergences. And these divergences prevented them from becoming a nation. Why did not those city-states that were so evolved merge into a nation-state? Because they had the divergences also. In Egypt and in India, the attempt was made with partial success, but generally by, by, but generally by welding together of small units into a nation seems to have come about by subjugation of all by one clan, one city, or one regional unit. You see, one clan or one city or one, one regional unit dominates others and presses them into a nationhood. It was pressure from outside, it was military force, and it was, it was compressing the collectivities into unity. The first effort didn't come by, by a voluntary association of people. First came, seems to have come about by one unit of the whole group dominating others. One clan dominating others, or run region and unit, even up to last when Germany united. Well, it was Prussia who put the whole pressure on the whole of Germany and brought it together, isn't it? The, the pressure of Prussia brought uh, the latest instances of German unity. It was brought about by domination of Prussia over the other German states, you see. And unification was affected by uh, Prussia dominating. The, yes. In Rome, Macedon and the mountain tribes in Prussia effect, effected this task. Now, these new states of Asia, instead of consolidating the nation, went out for expansion and conquest under military impulse. And nation unit not being yet firmly rooted, self-conscious and irresistibly one. So the pre-nation empires like Assyria, Macedonia and Rome could not endure. This, he gives you the reading of why empires that were formed in pre-nation period were dissolved or collapsed. It is because uh, they were too early, you see. Uh, to, to, to organize the unity of mankind was too early for them. That is why Assyria, Macedonia, Rome could not endure. Where was the error? The error was in not carrying out the objective of nature in evolving first the nation aggregate. If they had busied themselves organizing the nation unit, they might have succeeded. But uh, they, they didn't get the inkling from nature. Sri Arundo says about it, the aggregates of mankind are organized, small or great, on the same basis as the creation of vital organism in physical nature. You observe the organization of vital organism in physical nature, well, the same process is applied to the organization of aggregate. The methods employed primarily are primarily external and physical, but the object is to deliver, to manifest that which is supra-rational or supra-physical, a psychological principle which is latent in nature, behind the operation of life and body, so that what nature does is in the organization of, you know, a life unit in, in physical nature, what it does is that it brings about the release of that which is behind the outer form, the, the psychological entity, or as he puts it here, the principle. Something supra-physical that wants to be released has been, is released by nature. The vital ego is first organized. The first organization is vital or ego, in small aggregates, the psychological element is strong along with the vital and the physical. In those organizations, in those collectivities where you find there is a strength and a power, you will see that when it got organized, the vital force and the psychic force or the soul force of the race, both were strong. Two elements were equally strong, strong along vital and physical. 
and in larger aggregates of the nation the psychological sense and the vital energy are there but they are not yet organized in very large units so in the formation of larger nation unit all these elements are to be organized these large nation units would have to contain small groups minor units within themselves a large nation is not made up only of individuals a large nation is made up of groups societies you know religious societies organize industrial societies or labor societies or societies which function as groups within the whole is it not the problem of large nation units is how to integrate the small units of which it is composed each one is not connected with the whole nation at once each one is connected with the whole through a group a social group religious group industrial group you know uh, and so on but the these large nation units would have to contain small groups minor units within themselves and the problem is sherindo says how to the component parts shall be subordinated to the new unity without their death and without their disappearance it is very difficult rome died because rome sucked the whole life of the group small groups of which she was the leader you see what rome did was not to allow the the small units to thrive and to grow keeping the unity you know always in view instead what rome did was that when her life was ebbing she banged upon the life of these groups and deprived them of their well, vital current and vital energy with the result that when rome had nothing else well they had nothing to supply to rome when rome was in danger well there was no, nothing on which she could depend the small units a religious group a social group a political group an industrial group a labor group if you keep it going and unite it in the nation there is chance of the whole nation being revitalized or kept alive by the life of the group or life of the individual who is in the group but if the group itself is deprived of its life or deprived of its existence or as he says the problem is how to integrate uh, component parts should be subordinated in such a way to a new unity without their deaths and without disappearance how to keep them alive and still keep the unity going well if you keep them alive probably the the, the life of the nation becomes weak comparatively in physical nature he quotes you see he writes in his book in physical nature vital organisms cannot live entirely on themselves if you see a tree it does not live on itself it has to live on many things outside so does the animal you see so in vital in physical nature vital organisms cannot live entirely on themselves they live either by interchange with other vital organisms or partly by their interchange and partly by devouring other organisms well this is common to separated physical life when physical life is independent this is indispensable you can't help it the in unification of life on the other hand an assimilation is possible when life is united then you need not live by devouring but not even by interchange but an assimilation is possible and the problem of larger nation unit today is of such an assimilation how to make an assimilation possible where one group would not devour other group you see would not live on other group how all, they have a common assimilation you see something common on which well uh, the groups are living he therefore suggests that there can be instead an association of units consciously subordinating themselves if the nation unit wants to become vigorous alive and uh, really successful as a nation unit and of uh, one unit of collective and aggregate life what they can do is that instead they can evolve an association of units consciously subordinating themselves to general unity 
which is developed in the process of coming together. When groups came together, a unity was developed and a conscious subordination of the group to the whole well, would be, is conceivable. That is, that is why the war of the South and the Northern states was there, you see, where the group thought that it had an independent life to live because of certain fundamental difference. And the, the unity that was brought about was to realize that in the largest interest of the whole, the differences were not so great. And the differences, if they were fundamental, had to be well, adjusted on the basis of an ethical or a moral principle of equality of man, the birthright of man, freedom and liberty. You see, the, the, the forcing of the southern states was not domination of the north over the side, now the south. It was really speaking, driving to the mentality of the south, the necessity of equality and democracy. I mean, equality of man, really, it was that. And on the basis of it was that, that the northern states had to fight and, and bring the southern states together. That if we remain together, all of us, it will be on this basis. And uh, this establishment of this basis necessitates that the smaller group should subordinate consciously to the larger group. The defect of the Roman Empire was that it destroyed the cultural individuality of the units it governed and so died of starvation for want of vital energy flowing to it in time of need. When she needed, the Roman had nobody to depend upon, but it was starved out. Now in the 12th chapter, we have the idea of uh, nation building in Europe. That is the subject matter how the nation building in Europe took place. This is a general growth of nation unit from smaller units to larger units with the complicated difficulties of adjustment of smaller units within the larger units and how nature goes on forming units on certain basis when physical life is separated in a group or well, it necessitates interchange and devouring. And is it possible then to organize collective life in such a way as to make assimilation the common process of groups that live in one nation. If common groups are living in one nation, is it possible for them to live on, to bring into uh, their life the principle of assimilation and not of interchange and mutual devouring? The cycle of nation building in Europe. This was a slow process in three stages of unity without killing the constituent elements. This is what European nationhood achieved in three steps or three stages. It was in the medieval ages that it began, the, the organization of national life. These stages are inevitable under complex modern conditions also, the three stages. Externally, Circumstances and institution compelling some kind of sufficient order and common civilization must be there before a nation is formed. When can a nation be formed? Outwardly speaking, there must be circumstances and institutions <clears throat> which compel some kind of order and common civilization. If that is not there, it's difficult to form a nation. There must be prevailing values of cultural life already in existence, common accepted ideas of what is good or some kind of common belief. You see, it, it is already there before the nation comes into being. Institutions and circumstances compelling some kind of order and common civilization must be there. Secondly, a stringent order directed by unity means establishment of central control. When that condition is there, second is establishment of a central control, a centralizing authority. And thirdly, free internal development. It must then be allowed freely to develop internally from within out. But these three stages are indispensable for formation of a living nation. The first stage tends to create a social hierarchy. Generally, when the first stage is there, institutions compelling sufficient order and you know, um, 
common civilization, then there is generally division of functions. Based on division of functions, there is a hierarchy. There may be, for instance, religious hierarchy, political or economic, or work or labor, like that. This process took place in Europe and in Asia at the same time under different names, but the principle was the same. A common cultural external institutional background and a social order in which there was a kind of social hierarchy. You know, the noble and the aristocrat and the knight and the samurai and the kshatriya and the brahmin and so on. Yeah, that, that sort of, uh, you know, that, that is the beginning. And yet, it is curious to observe that Islam, based on equality, failed to evolve a nation unit. It is, it is one of the most, uh, you know, uh, uh, religions which most insists on equality. In fact, they try to carry it out to, to a very great extent in life. And yet, in spite of it, it has not succeeded in evolving a powerful nation unit. In the struggle, the church versus the state, the, 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 the state won in Europe. And Shirando says about it, it was a symbol of the law that self-conscious and politically organized nation can have only one supreme central authority and it must be a secular authority. He generalizes on the on the on the what happened in Europe when you know the religious authority was put down. You see, it was a symbol of the law that self-conscious and politically organized nation can have only one supreme and central authority. It must be a secular state, secular power. This is proved by the working I, my remarks about it. It is proved by the working of the theocratic states such as Pakistan in modern times. You see, it has proved a retrograde step in the evolution of collective life in, in mankind today. Uh, that it could not function effectively under a democratic constitution and that it was obliged to bring military dictatorship well, to save itself from utter chaos shows that a theocratic state in modern times is an anomaly. If you can't have it, you see, it is really, it doesn't work. Pakistan also is a state that has come into being against a historical tent towards human unity. India was one, and uh, one India could have joined the whole one humankind. Instead, it wanted a, a divided India, you see, so that it was in one sense a retrograde state from the drive of unity of mankind. The second stage is directed towards, the second stage is that of, you know, the stringent order or establishment of a central authority, is it not? Central control. That is the second element which comes into being when the nation develops. You see, the first is a order which is privilege order and then a establishment of a central authority. Is directed towards unity, towards establishing a centrality of control, a leveling and uniformity under central direction. When this stage in the evolution of the nation comes and becomes effective, the hierarchy created by the first step becomes loose, has to loosen its grip and dissolve itself. That is what happens, you see, all over, wherever the central authority came, became very strong, aristocratic class or, you know, the, the religious class that were privileged had to, had to become weak or comparatively less important. In India, British domination did this work. The, this stage takes away the freedom of the individual, certainly, but it establishes central control, one law and one authority. It takes away individual liberty in the second stage of nation development. It takes away liberty, but uh, individual freedom, but established one authority in one law. Well, the code Napoleonic, for the matter of that, is the first code that came into existence in Europe. Do you know that? Before that, the citizens were not be equal before law. And it was imposed. It was not voted by the people. You understand? Point is centralization. We are only seeing at the point where the nation unit organizes central authority. And he shows con the contradictory appearance that uh, sometimes Monarchs have contributed to the centralizing of the nation unit. 
even monarchy has contributed to the bringing together of the nation together. It has happened. It looks contradictory that nation that wants and swears by freedom and democracy should have a very important contribution made to its existence or its growth by well, absolute authority of the king sometimes. Well, here in the, yes, it has established central control. In this connection, the historical role of monarchy has to be judged quite different from current view. This is a very fine argument he has put in this chapter 12, you see. It has to be seen as a powerful factor in bringing the whole nation unit into existence. For example, he says, Ivan, Peter and Catherine in Russia. Even this, yes. Tudors and Plantagenets in England. The Capets in France and Hohenzollerns in Germany. Mikado in Japan. You study the role, then you will see that the centralizing of the nation unit was affected by this authority, which is arbitrary, monarchical, and seems absolute in its working. All these contributed to the attainment of maturity to the respective nations. The severity seen during this stage was inevitable stage in the formation of the nation unit by political and mechanical means. Well, politically you have to bring, mechanically you have to bring, then force and exertion of force was indispensable. It was not a natural wickedness of the rulers that you have to see. Monarchical authority concentrated in its activity the whole national life. That is why uh, I think Queen Elizabeth could say that uh, the attack of the Spanish Armada was attack on England and all England could feel that it was so. <laughs> it was not only authority of Elizabeth that was at stake, but the nation, the, the, how the nation was made to feel the unity, you see, under the central authority. And this establishing of order and central power was indispensable necessity in the growth of the nation unit. The end of the 18th yes, the second stage was bound therefore to topple. This could not have lasted very long. The king's authority, you see, the undisputed arbitrary power of a central authority could not last. It was bound to topple over. The bourgeoisie led the revolt. The common man, you see, because he had the talent. He was irritated by the inferiority to which he was subjected. And then thinkers had awakened into the, into the nation. Thinkers whose ideas also got people convinced of the truth of their ideas. And they took the masses with them. So the central authority was had to top all over by the revolt of the bourgeoisie, the thinker, and the spread of, you know, ideas among the masses, an organization of masses for freedom. <coughs> A large unit, large, the large nation unit came thus into existence. At the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, the ideal of democratic nation came to the front in France. It caught the mind of all the people, but even in Europe it didn't work out as I told you before immediately. It, uh, I think it, uh, Central Europe and Russia were imperialistic and Germany was monarchical. But still the idea had triumphed not only in Europe but in America and even in Asia, where Turkey, Persia, India, China caught the flame of the democratic uh, inspiration and uh, France gave the ideals of liberty, equality and fraternity to political life of mankind. It was Germany who gave the first organized state to Europe and thus, well, uh, lending shape unconsciously to socialistic idea. She was not conscious of socialism, but uh, without knowing and unconsciously she brought the socialistic idea into existence. It was the perfectly organized state that gave Germany the tremendous success she got initially in the First World War. And even though Germany was defeated, Sherundo says that the idea for which she stood, a perfectly organized state, had won, and other states in Europe followed the state idea. It is this which now figures in some of the nations as democratic socialism. That is, just now it has given the name of democratic socialism. Then I quote from him his writing, the nation unit is not formed and does not exist merely for the sake of existing. The race is there in labor of formation of a still larger unit. 
a greater mold of collective life. The nation unit may stand and there is likelihood that it may stand in the way of formation of this larger unit which must evolve out of this nation unit to which collective life of man has come as the most effective, you know, I mean, mold for its, ex for its expression. But liberty has become the watchword of the race. Religion once suppressed liberty and had to go. He said there is a saving, you know, I mean, a situation that liberty is there as an established watchword of all the people, individual as well as nations. The individual wants liberty, nations want liberty. So, liberty has become the watchword of the whole race. Religion once suppressed liberty and had to abdicate. Kings trampled upon liberty under their feet, they had to go. Capitalism tried to put down liberty, it is threatened. Is it not? Mm -hmm. Yes. With liberty, man gets his dignity and freedom of manhood. So that is the first step we have. The real strength of this tendency of liberty, individual and collective, you see, the real strength is in its intellectual, idealistic and emotional parts, not in its political and military and economic strength. Mark that. You, you follow? The, the real strength of this idea, tendency towards liberty, is not in its military, economic and administrative side, but as he says here, intellectual, idealistic and emotional parts. That is its real strength. Its economic causes are partly permanent and therefore elements of strength and secure fulfillment, partly artificial and temporary. Whatever economic, you know, you know driver tendencies there is only, and therefore elements of insecurity and weakness. The political incentives are the baser parts of the whole amalgam. When one thinks of liberty in terms of only politics, political incentive, well, that brings in the very low element of human nature into existence. It is idealistic, intellectual and emotional parts that are really the strength of this tendency. Their presence may even vitiate the whole result presence of economic and political motives, you see, and lead in the end to a necessary dissolution and reversal of whatever unity may be initially accomplished. Whatever unity man can accomplish is merely drive of economic and political incentives will push it back, will make it retrograde. With liberty, justice is necessary. Because if you give man complete liberty, well, he will just do what he shouldn't do to others, you see. And therefore, justice is necessary. And therefore, equality. Not absolute equality, for it is impossible. But equal opportunity in life, in training and share in the state. This is the proclaimed goal of secular democratic socialism. I quote from his writing now. The new supranational or supranational order must be a free association of international life constituted by free nations and it must lead peacefully and by natural unfolding of the spiritual and ethical progress of the race to such a secure, just and healthy political, social and economic foundation as might enable mankind to turn from its preoccupation with these lower cares and begin at last that development of its higher self which is the nobler part of its potential destiny or if not that for who knows whether nature's long experiment in human type is foredoomed to success or failure at least the loftiest possibility of our future with the human mind can envisage unity of mankind you see Perhaps liberty and equality, liberty and authority, liberty and organized efficiency can never be quite satisfactorily reconciled. Liberty and equality. Because if you give perfect liberty, you too. 
put down equality. If you give equality, you have to restrict liberty. Liberty and authority. Liberty and organized efficiency can never be quite satisfactorily reconciled so long as man, individual and collect, aggregate, lives by egoism. Liberty and organized efficiency can never be quite satisfactorily reconciled so long as man, individual and collect, aggregate, lives by egoism. So long as he cannot undergo a greater spiritual and psychological change and rise beyond mere communal association to that third ideal with some vague inner sense made the revolutionary thinkers of France add to their watchwords of liberty and equality. They didn't know why they were adding. You see, probably liberty and equality was quite enough. Mm. Some vague inner sense made the revolutionary thinkers of France add to their watchwords of liberty and equality. The greatest of all the three, though till now only an empty word on man's lips. The idea of fraternity. Or less sentimentally and more truly expressed, an inner oneness. It's not only fraternity, but an inner oneness. That no mechanism, social, political, or religious, has ever created or can create. It must take birth in the soul of the individual, you see and rise from the hidden and divine depths from within. Well, that gives you the end of chapter 12, I think. And you can go a little further, perhaps one more chapter you can take. No? <laughs> we are going to chapter 14. <laughs> yes. Well, that gives you some idea of uh, political philosophy. What is political philosophy in the light of life divine, is it not? Well, you get a full dose of it. <laughs> we might take up, no? I think so. What do you say? Um, if you think it is enough, I don't know. <laughs> I'm ready for the next one chapter anyway. Huh? Well, we take one chapter 14th at any rate. Possibility of the first step towards international unity. That's the chapter, you see. And uh, what are the difficulties? That is 14th chapter of this ideal of human unity. Well, um, he says that same course that uh, nation's evolution had to follow and the same difficulty which nation unit had to undergo in coming to life and becoming effective might be also met by this international unity of mankind, you see. The same, we have seen some course of the difficulties to which nation unit passes in the beginning. It has to have a centralized authority which becomes very dictatorial and puts a central control. That's, that's one kind of thing. And uh, then the authority is trampled over and then you find uh, liberty as a watchword coming in and, and putting the nation unit in an effective you know, uh, organizing group life into it in such a way as to keep the group living and yet living within the unity of the whole. Well, the same difficulties will arise to the unity of mankind allowing the nation unit to remain living and thriving under its unity. The same obstacle, then how to get a central authority? That will be the problem, isn't it? So he says nation unit difficulties might be repeated in the organization of this international whole, the unity of mankind. Well, because here we have got loose masses of mankind, vague forces are acting, material also is all over scattered, so to say it's not in an organized form as to transform human unity. Secondly, democratic socialism all over the world in nations have come to the front. The politician also is working and he is an obstacle. The politician in every race, every nation, he is also he is an obstacle because he is working on average mentality, average intelligence, 
and that means to say he is ruled by interest uh, he is, um, and even with uh, passion and prejudice he is also not ruled by thought is he not he is not ruled by idealism or thinking he is in the interest and uh, he is afraid to change to bring anything new because he wants to be elected next time <laughs> see that's all <laughs> so he's afraid of any change he tries, tries to continue status quo in everything. Fourth factor is that the old order or old values have completely collapsed. There was a time when, in Victorian time, you could have a settled order for 50 years. I mean, what is right, what is good, uh, what must be, what must not be, what is proper and what is improper was definite absolutely fixed even the way in which you must move in a, in a group life you know and the order in which a dinner should be arranged was fixed and who must speak and how you must speak and uh, you know who will <laughs> well it was terrific order but it was order anyway <laughs> all the values are gone and finished they're broken to pieces and it was perhaps good it is necessary because that self-complacence as if one had reached the peak of culture and was only one work was to do oh, the burden of culture to pass this wonderful culture to other people who are less fortunate than themselves. It was such a self complacency that it took our breath away when we were fighting for freedom. Now, we have seen that victory in age. We know what it is, you see. And it, it simply, I couldn't imagine human beings thinking they were perfect, first of all. <laughs> You know, the first difficulty was to believe that anybody in the world could think, and they did, I tell you, they did. They thought, they, we are now nothing. Heaven is, 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 we represent heaven. And they always used to laugh at, at Indian seriously thinking, you know, that is what um, MacDonald, the Prime Minister of India, where he was not the Prime Minister and a Labour member, visited India in 1906. Mm, Ramsey McDonald, you see, and uh, his first reaction when he came to contact with the spirit of India, I mean, real Indians, was the staggeringly smallness of his own, own cultural size. He says, we feel before India, means European culture, you see, he's, he representing English culture. We feel before India like a decent-minded prize fighter before a saint. <laughs> and that was true. He, he, he's a good, decent mind, very honest fighter. This is a prize fighter. This is coming at Here he found the Indians asking for freedom and they said, but you have no, no army, you have no unity, you have no organization, you have no political idea. And no Indian believed it. He was staggered at that. He was a politician, boiled politician, you see. He had done politics all his life and he came. He was sympathetic to India. He was not anti-Indian at all. He wanted that India should be free. But he said, what will you do? And Indians didn't listen. They said, there is mother India. She must become free. He said, these are fanatic people. <laughs> they, uh, he actually felt that. Men of 70, men of 60, men of 75, money, not young, you know, hot headed revolutionaries, no, old people grown in culture, had read world's literature. When he talked with them in Calcutta on dinner, they said, No, no, you don't know, Mother India is free and Mother India must be free. Oh, we cannot have the mother in bondage any longer. He said, What is this logic and what is this politics? Where is your party? Where are your funds? Where is your army? Where is your resistance? No thought. He was staggered. He couldn't believe. Well, see, that's that. That's India. <laughs> <laughs> that's one side. Well, yeah, we are talking about the place of something inner in this scheme of things. Mm. The moral collapse of the whole order, you see. Therefore, some order has now got to emerge, he says. That order was terrific, you know, idea. We have seen that order. It was steel frame. ICS was called the steel frame that was governing India. He never mixed with anyone because he was superior. He was, he was great. And Indians laughed at him. He was a young man, they used to say. Oh, he has no experience. 
<laughs> oh, he doesn't know what is life. Indians talk them themselves when the ISIS collector thinking going on the great government. Oh, and, and, and uh, all these people don't know anything. Well, the people think he doesn't know anything, they said. He's quite inexperienced. Oh, he has got power now, so he thinks he, power one can't remain with. You see, power can't remain with, with one man forever. Power has to go. And they went on this sort of thing, and they, they, this collection never knew what they were thinking about. <laughs> it was ridiculous. I have seen a fisherman <laughs> passing a remark about European culture, just so deep, you see. They were talking in their language, the, 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 the foreign couple, I don't know who it was, they didn't know their language. And he said, oh, he's holding her by the hand. He's afraid she'll run away. Why? Why is holding her by the hand, he's telling. <laughs> it is not a judgment on culture, but it's a way of looking at things so different culturally. You see, so therefore the European is natural and quite spontaneous and I think very good. The expression of mutual relationship. But to, to, an, to an West Eastern mind, it looks as if, uh, why so much ex insistence on anything external for the matter of that? You understand, it's not that it is not good, it is good. But there's a way of looking at it. And uh, they will, why so much insistence on, on, on external? If, if it is unity, it is unity, is it not? If it is relation, it is relation, whether expressed or not expressed, in the, in the outer, I mean. Well, uh, the way of looking, it's not that this is right or that is wrong, no. It, it's the difference, and the difference has a basis, that's all. Not that the one is good or another is bad, nothing of the kind. I think both are good. <laughs> <laughs> both are good because both express some reality, some truth. Both are expression of a truth. You see, that is uh, what I wrote in my in one of my reminiscences when I visited England, you see. I was guest of Professor Cyril Bailey, you see, he is 84 now, for instance, now I don't know whether he's alive, because he was 84 in 55 when I went to England, and I was his guest one day, and he and Mrs. Bailey, you see, were looking after me and so on, so I said, I must be looking after you, you are old, 85, you see, and uh, very nice man, very cultured, the way in which he was living an English family, you see. Now, I could put my mind to India and see how a couple of 85, you know, one 85 and another, she was about 60, I think, or 62 or 65, uh, how they behaved and how a couple in India would have behaved. Well, it brought to my mind the contrast of the way in which an equally cultured, uh, you know, uh, social life is conceivable <laughs> on two different lines on together. <laughs> it was it was very fine experience, I think. It is. I had a I had a friend in India like that who was old, quite old, eighty four, eighty two, and his wife was alive, sixty seven or so, and the way they lived and the way in which Dr. Cyril Bell and his wife lived was to me a study. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a, well, how the same truth expresses itself or same reality or same relation finds expression in two different modes, you see, of culture. And, um, well, one may say that temperamentally he likes one or like the other. That is only a temperamental expression, but fundamentally the thing I think is the same. It's the same, it's the same reality that finds expression. Some kind of international system has become inevitable because of the collapse of the old values, you see. After the Second War, it has become terrific. The collapse has become a confusion, you see. And that is what she, I think C. D. Lewis, Herbert Reed, and some of the top, I mean, intellectuals in England have noticed. You see, you know, what is it? I think it was. Yes, C. De Lewis has said that uh, European culture is not a, a, a not one current uh, in which one can flow, but it's a cross current of many currents flowing together, and one has to find his way in that. It is, you see, it's a, it's a, it's a current full of many cross currents inside. And that is true because old values have gone and 
finished and new ones have not come and then certain things are trying to catch hold and certain reactions are there certain hopes are there ideals are there and it is a it is a turmoil really speaking it's a cauldron that is that is why a new you know inevitability of something international system uh, arising or emerging is necessary the questions are for instance how to eliminate war limitation of armament settlement of disputes without fighting or organization of commercial and uh, aims and interest on a on a base of peace well these are the problems that are there once begun he says it will be impossible for mankind to draw back i'm quoting his sentence that this international order has to come it has become a necessity once begun, it will be impossible for mankind to draw back. And 40 years back, he wrote, remember. And whatever difficulties, disappointments, struggles and reactions, checks and brutal interruptions might mark the course of its, this development, they would be bound to help in the inevitable result. It must come into being. The result is evolution of an international order. It must come. In spite of difficulties, disappointments, struggle, reactions, checks, brutal interruptions, they will be only marking the progress, but it has got to come. War can be abolished only if national armaments are abolished. That's quotation. The awakening must go deeper and lay hold upon much purer roots of action before the psychology of nations will be transmuted into that something wondrous, rich and strange, which will eliminate war from human life. If war is to be eliminated, well, this is the condition. The awakening must go much deeper. You see, and lay hold upon much purer roots of action before the psychology of the nations will be transmuted into that something, wondrous, rich and strange, which will eliminate war from human life. Wherever egoism is, I'm quoting it. The root, egoism is the root of action. It must bear its own proper results and reactions. And however minimized and kept down they may be by an external machinery, their eventual outburst is sure and can only be delayed but not prevented forever. So if the nations behave on the basis or act on the basis of egoism, it can only be rebound on them by a reaction. We cannot avoid the reaction. So that the necessity is to go to a deeper root of feeling and action. The stumbling block in the new creation would be possibly national egoism. That is one. And that's why I quoted the passage of egoism. Because limitation of armaments when they are thinking of it is only illusory remedy. It only lightens the burden in peace time. It doesn't do anything more. And this international authority will have to come into being if it is to be effective. And if international authority is there, something like an international state or an international organization with sufficient force must be brought into being. Chapter 14. <laughs> One. The great and help towards understand towards unity be the understanding of differences and the allowing of differences. Yes, uh, it is understanding really on this basis that without variation there can be no real unity. Hmm. You see, unity is expression of oneness based on variation, based on multiplicity, so based on variation. And the variation is necessary. That is why a drive towards unity must not become a drive towards uniformity. Okay. Uh, with the current youth and the stress and the strain toward, uh, quote, peace movements, world peace, system, and so on, and, um, Orban's expression that this cannot come about except at the uh, in inner level, inner yes. Level. Yet, um, 
the inner development of man is something about which man does nothing to a degree because this is already working out. So what sort of impasse do we come to? How do we satisfy the mind of these kids that are saying we must have peace, we must do something about it? Uh, and yet, um, if you teach them the inner, is this violating uh, their normal rhythms? Am I mm -hmm. making myself mm -hmm. clear? Yes. No, no they, they well, if they if they take to peace as an ideal, and they are not as a as a as a vital counterpart against anything. There can be two ways of m making a movement for peace. Yeah. So they're both, they're, they're, yes. They're the one is uh, simply a vital revolt against, uh, you know, whatever somebody is doing, yeah. either government or an organization or somebody. Well, that is really undesirable because that will not bring the real thing. But if it is an idealistic movement, mm -hmm. then behind it is a psychic being already working. Mm -hmm. But if it is goaded by an idealism, an ethical idealism or intellectual idealism, by an idea, ideal of liberty, equality or fraternity or oneness of mankind or equality of mankind, you see, if that is really the, the living driving force, then it is something which has already got a psychic element in it. It might lead ultimately to the awakening of the inner soul. So that that is a movement which can be uh, fostered. Uh, the one that rises up as a as something against you know a measure or against a policy or against some something being done by somebody well in that case that is only a vital reaction and it won't have any root it won't have any reality behind it, it will be on the surface and it will die out it won't uh, realize even what it wants to realize it won't because it really seriously doesn't want to realize it's only a reaction against something <laughs> It has no deeper root in the being, you see. <clears throat> you can see those two movements very easily mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. the, the way they, mm -hmm. they react. I, I, uh, when I think of these two, uh, the lectures in the morning and the, you know, the, or the talks in the morning and talks at night, I think over them just before I go to sleep, uh, I see such a, a great similarity in their purpose and their mm -hmm. meaning. Yes. Overcoming the ego. So yes, yes. You see, see, when those vision is cosmic, and there is no field of life which is outside his scheme of human perfection. Therefore, there is no problem on which he has no light to give. He has guidance for every problem of life. That is the sign of a rishi in India. You see, sign of a rishi is that he gives you. The, the dharma of the age, the, some idea of how to prepare yourself for the truth that is coming, in whatever field of life you may happen to be. You may be in, in any field of life, but a rishi when he comes, he sees vision of the truth. And the vision of a truth is not unrelated to life. A rishi is not a sannyasi, he is not a renounced man. A rishi is a man of vision. And what he sees is a dynamic truth which is coming to mankind. And he sees it in advance of his age. He sees it 1,000, 2,500 years before anybody else sees. And then he gives to the people living, collectivities, nations and individuals the norm of life, the rule of life or the, the way of life by which they can prepare themselves for the truth that is coming. He knows that the truth is, is going to come. Well, the best way for man is to prepare for it. And he gives the humanity the way to prepare for the coming of a greater truth, which is already on the way, which is already throwing its rays on the present, you see. It is throwing its rays and pulling, you know, the present towards it. Well, the best way that man can do is to prepare for it. And the Rishi comes before anybody else has seen the truth, if he is a great Rishi, he sees the whole truth and not a part of it. And when he sees the whole truth, he sees the whole field of life and can full the illumination of it, the light of it, he can throw on all the fields of life and show how in each field that light is going to work. And how to prepare in each field for receive the, to receive the light. 
he gives what India calls the dharma of the dharma means the 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 norm of life, you know, the rule of life by which you can prepare yourself to receive the truth. Therefore, for the politician, for the nation builder, for the economist, for for the educationist, for everybody, there is uh, light of Sri Aurobindo available if he wants to take it. That is why we travel thousands of miles to come and, and see if somebody wants to see. It's not that it's nothing new to us. And it's nothing that we are disappointed. If nobody listens, it doesn't matter. Truth is there all the time. There is no disappointment at all because truth is truth and it is going to work. It is going to work. It is man's choice uh, to profit by it or to, well, to be forced into it or, or to oppose it. It depends on man. <laughs> it is men's <laughs> this business. May I ask one more question? Yes. Uh, you just said uh, man must prepare. Yeah, that's why it, we man, take trouble to see. It, you see. And I want to finish the question. Man must prepare, yet man must surrender, which means no prepare. In other words, this is the. Um, no, he can't, he can't surrender unless he prepares. That's the best point. You, the preparation is the preceding stage. Yes. You can only surrender after you have completed it. Yes, when you understood what, what, what surrender is for and to whom. Yeah. And why. <laughs> yeah. It's encouraging to know that the truth is coming or is already. Yes, but that w wouldn't profit any if we don't, uh, I mean, uh, you know. Either allow it or get get hold of us. Otherwise, uh, it may be there and it may be passing over our head. <laughs> yes, but you said it was coming. Yes, it yes. already is, and you don't care. I mean, in fear. Yes, it is. It yes. is right here. But we have to receive it. <laughs> most literally, <laughs> it is here. <laughs> in the most literal sense of the term. That's why we meditate here. <laughs> because it is here, we want to bring it down in us. <laughs> Open us, open ourselves to it and ask it to get in, as far as we can allow it to. <laughs> but this is necessary, isn't it? This mm -hmm. is essential that we do this, that we open to this. Yes, only we don't want to do it in an external way, you know, what people call propaganda and mm -hmm. uh, agitation and restless and unlistened, nothing of the kind. You be sure of the truth first. Be sure of the truth. And then be loyal to it and be surrendered to it oneself. Rest will follow. There's no hurry. <laughs> Rest has to follow. With difficulties, resistance, obstacles, they are part of the game, is it not? So you can't simply say, oh, why is why? Why is no? Because things are like that. <laughs> There's no why. <laughs> uh, there is a movement in the Episcopalian churches now, I understand where they are what they call uh, speaking in tongues. Do you know anything about that? Does anybody know anything about it? Mm -hmm. Apparently you sit and then all of a sudden uh, you speak. I don't know. I've, mm -hmm. never, I've never been to one of the meetings. But English Episcopal, Episcopal Church? Uh, yes. It in is, England? No, in the... Uh, oh, here. And mm -hmm. there's one in the Marin that I heard about, which is the high church, not the low church. And they have their meetings, their healing meetings, and then they have their other meetings in which uh, I understand the the pre the preacher whoever he is, and uh, the others put their hands on his shoulder and just transfer into power, mm -hmm. and then somebody breaks out and starts speaking in tongues. Now, what is this? I mean, I don't know. But this seems so strange. Seems like come from the best kind. Sounds like garbage cook. Well, uh, it's no, it is. It well, is you a, mentioned about this Bible yeah. running from here to there, and this is from what about No, it is a sign that men are are, are wanting to, to have something more than externally what is available or what they can have, either ideas, thoughts, or organizations. They want to have some direct contact with something more than visible world, and they have the contact. That's all right. Only the question is which visible world, invisible world you contact. That's all. Because uh, there is a plenty of hierarchy and in the hurry to get or in a ignorant mood or egoistic searching with ambition and with something that I must prove myself and so on, you might just contact something 
halfway intermediate zone and uh, those powers may not be the powers that are representative of the truth. They might be the powers that are really not, not of the truth, you see. They are occult powers and all occult is not truth, you see. Occult is very often a mixture of truth and falsehood. Well, truth and falsehood, they are generally the occult is full of vital forces which are full of ambition. And they catch hold of human being with ambition to fulfill themselves rather than uh, bring any truth which is superior to them. You see. That is a tragedy of man's seeking because when he is not sincere in his seeking for the truth, he asks immediately for some power. And the vital world is full of forces that always promise you fulfillment of power. You see. <laughs> well, I'm not a student of the Bible, but there's something rather in the, it, in when Christ was the master Jesus was talking to his disciples, and there's something in there where the, they spoke in tongues, and whether these people are trying to recapture that, and whether it's just, you say, a desire for power. Yes. What they should really do is to, to renovate or create or live themselves in the Christ consciousness, if they are seriously... Christian, I mean, they really want to believe in Christianity and Christ. The best they can do is to live the Christ consciousness in themselves. That means to awaken the divine consciousness because that is Christ consciousness. That that would be real, yeah. and probably they might find that that leads them to this vision. Immediately they are in that consciousness, they might feel the whole totality of the vision which you have was given. It is, that is very likely to happen. But they say they're in the Christ consciousness when they're not. This is what the... That's a distortion. Mm -hmm. That's a distortion. They say they're in the Christ consciousness. They say the Holy Spirit descends when they're in the Christ consciousness. That any vital force will say like that. Any vital force will say like that. When it wants to catch hold of the human being or communicate its own working to the human being, it will always say what the human being would like him to say. If the human being likes that Christ should be there, it would say, I am Christ. That's all. It doesn't mean that it is Christ. It is like the other man on the telephone end. <laughs> yes, and he says, are you so and so? Yes, of course I am. You know, that's all. But he may be just trying to, because you, he knows that you want that it should be he. So he says, yes, I am that. <laughs> and should I, are these alcohol? Uh, these occult impressions are they are they ever accompanied by light very rarely they have their own light they have the light but if you have connection with the true light then you know the relativity of the light but hardly they, they are not accompanied but they have their own light which is not of the same type or the same color or intensity as the as the true light of the divine light, you see. Yeah, um, person, of course, who they've never had anything to do with the occult and doesn't want anything to do with it, wouldn't know. I mean, they they wouldn't know. I wouldn't know. Well, it wouldn't come to you, perhaps. Why are you afraid? That's It wouldn't come to you unless you're prepared in some way. And it would come only to the to the extent or to the opening that you give. So if you give opening to the higher light, then only higher light will come. The other light have no chance of entering. No light can enter the human being or no being can enter the human being unless a, an opening is given. Wow. And our opening may be uh, through ignorance you can give opening to anything, you see. Because you are full of desire or full of ego or full of ambition. Well, you want and then immediately anything rushes, yes, that's all. But if you are full of devotion, full of surrender and aspiration for truth, then only that light will enter. The others have no entry. Human being is a protected fort. It's a fortress that is protected, even by ignorance. The ignorance itself protects it. No other being, other <laughs> Yes. Because other being would not come and impinge easily and break through. If he was open to all the forces, man would be... You know, <laughs> shattered to pieces, I think, no doubt. So many tremendous powers are around him, but he's all right. <laughs> In his shell, he's all right. And only thing that can come through is through his opening. Yes, yeah, because these troubled um, forces, or interest in subtle forces, 
one sign that we are on the threshold of a farther yes yes so there is a sign that uh, oh, good that yes that the matter is not the only only end of existence that there are you know subtle entities that are at work and and still greater heights are possible mm -hmm. it's a stirring of the inner worlds did that which brought the world war second world war the stirring of the whole vital world mm -hmm. on a large scale because the light was coming could it also be that these organized churches uh, are losing their hold on people and they're they're going for sensation seeking or anything to perhaps yes instead of taking the longer path difficult path of realizing Christ consciousness it's a shortcut in one sense <laughs> but there isn't any shortcut that way I don't know it I won't know. last very long but this is a pretty vicious thing if that is with intent to hold their power of the organization. Yes. <laughs> I somehow yeah. kind of can doubt it. it, it, it I mean, it's not that it's a particular person. No, it's a homeless. It. There's a magazine that oh. down half an issue. There's a whole movement. And uh, uh, there's, a, a, some, there's a, a monk, a Catholic monk. Uh, that um, but from down Santa Barbara, and he mm -hmm. went to one of these meetings, and he had these experiences. And um, I don't know. My aunt brought one of them. Well, then one man, I forget his name now. He is having huge meetings and addressing them, and so on. James, somebody, how much is he? He's a young, quite young man. Huh? Billy Graham. Yes, yes, yes. Then, well, uh, well, then, then, well, that's, that's different, different, that's different, different entirely. entirely. What? No, I said there are so many forces like that going over. The whole cosmic movement is working, you see, and so all things will work in a cauldron like that. You know. mm -hmm. What one has to do is to get the thread and get along working, that's all. You can't take cognizance of all that, 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 that one, one rationale about it and let it work out its own way because the universal will have its own pressure and will work some common result out. It's a big cauldron. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, what kind of forces the, the material I'm going to call a fundamental being? You know, I, I think Mother wrote that that the, the vital gods are very, very bright and they have a lot of uh, light and so on. Mm -hmm. And that the overmental gods are so much higher, and then yet the supermental are much, much higher than that. <coughs> uh, I mean, do you get influences on the spiritual path from these overmental beings? Well, overmental is really speaking the, the truth consciousness or the cosmic consciousness not subjected to ignorance. They're not, they're not, not subjected to ignorance, that is over mind. Over mind is cosmic consciousness and globing the whole lower triplicity of mind, life and matter, covering it like big wings as we read the other day, you know, covering like a wing. But it is before the jump of the cosmic consciousness into ignorance and knowledge, both combined now. Cosmic consciousness is a mixture of two. Over mind is in the knowledge, in the truth. But yet is a first step down from the infinity and eternity of the truth consciousness. So that its relation with the truth consciousness is organic and direct. But it allows each possibility, each divine power, each divine force to try to realize itself. So that it releases, as he says in Life Divine, million gods into operation. Each empowered or inspired to create a world of his own. That is why you find different idealisms here, current in the world, you see. But that is over mental working. They are the over mental gods, you see. Aren't, aren't they ignorant in comparison to no. the No, not ignorant. So uh, they, are, they are conscious of their force being derived from the supramental or truth conscious. There is always some truth in that sort of movement, you will see. You take communism, there is some truth behind it. It is not a movement of falsehood. Completely nothing at the bottom. It is. It is some truth is behind it. Well, it is a truth that has to be found, and not the outer form or constitution or the party form which it takes. You see, the idealism has behind it some force of reality, and that reality is to be embodied here, and not the, not the you know the 
outer aspect of it political or social or economic. That is secondary. The real thing that inspires is, is something spiritual. So is democracy. And it's something, it's not only a constitution or, you know, uh, like either America or any other country and so on. That is not democracy. Democracy is the deepest spiritual truth of the soul. The freedom of the individual uh, before the divine. That's all. The individual is absolutely free. That translates itself and throws itself in the in the constitution. And that becomes an idealism, so to say. But idealism is it is embodiment of a spiritual truth. It's not an idea. All ideas derive their, their justification from a reality. There is no mere idea. People don't know. Idea can arm itself into an army. <laughs> Idea can be armed as an army. Idea is not something hanging in the clouds, you see. Not every time, but there are times when idea is armed. And you can see an army is not merely an army, but it's an idea that has got arms. And it is the idea that is winning. Not this man or that man or that. That happens very often. Only critical times, yes. Right. If there are veils between us and the truth consciousness, which by faith, I ask for you, we wait. We don't tell see, the truth consciousness now. See, here, I want this veil removed, and I want to see this light. Too. Yes. Uh, because we would um, call yes. a great deal of havoc yes. and destruction to our organisms. But we wait patiently. Are there Veils of darkness, and not veils of darkness so much as veils put between uh, universal consciousness in its steps towards universal realization of truth consciousness in, in a universal concept. Uh, do think... these veils have to be removed gradually by an outpouring of truth consciousness upon universal consciousness? No, the truth consciousness is already pouring in the universal consciousness. The difficulty is the individual is not opening. Well, can that be said so much for you, the universal consciousness? Yes, uh, you see, the truth consciousness is already operating, pouring, or you can say flowing upon the universal consciousness already. That is why in the universal consciousness you find so much unrest. Now, unrest can take thousands of forms, and one may think this is reason, that is reason, but really speaking, it is the pressure or the flow of the truth consciousness or the light which is uh, moving the cosmic movements. But cosmic movements cannot make them be self effective unless the group life creates an atmosphere. You see, the cosmic movement is, is not. Uh, capable of receiving the whole flow of the truth in the right way because the collective mind, collective consciousness, collective being of man is, is egocentric, is full of desire, full of ambition, full of interest, full of selfishness, economic, this, that. It has no, no capacity to percolate straight into the collective. So what the flow of the truth consciousness is doing is to find the individual. You see, to find the individual and try to see if the individual wants the truth. If the aspiration in the individual is there, well then the, certainly the higher life and truth consciousness can flow into him. 